Thank you, Alex. Uh, so welcome, everyone, to this uh, talk about uh, what's new in MLIR. And uh, I wanted to take a moment to note that four years ago, your LLVM at 2019 in Brussels, uh, we introduced MLIR and we open sourced it. And uh, since then, the adoption has been really more than what we expected. So we're always delighted to see this, both in academia and industry. And, um, you know, looking back, uh, I think no other company than Google could have allowed us the freedom to bootstrap MLIR the way it is. Uh, but now it was time for the community to take over. And I think even the affiliation of the speakers here is a testimony about, you know, how diverse the ecosystem has become and the community is. Uh, I'm always impressed by the creativity of people and what they do with MLIR. Uh, I'm impressed by all the PhD students and the ideas they bring uh, to MLIR. Um, and popularizing MLIR further and making those concepts even more available. Uh, there is the XDSL project that brings MLIR to Python and is revolutionary for teaching compilers. Now, all those MLIR concepts are readily available to students with a simple pip install, pip install of a Python project. Uh, and you're going to hear more about it further. Um, they're also in a totally different dimension, like in terms of innovation that MLIR is bringing now, our friends at Modular just announced their new language entirely built on top of MLIR, Mojo. But I may be too excited about the future, and I forgot that we are here to talk about more the past and what we implemented since last time we were at a dev meeting. And we're going to talk about, about all of that. So those are the past presentation. I try to include, um, for every topic, links to RFCs, to documentation, to presentations, if you want to dig further in the topic. Because today, uh, it's a recap, an overview of those changes. Um, but we're not going to have time to dig in details. So if some topic, you know, get your curiosity and you want to dig further, you're going to have the slides and you're going to be able to, to get there. All right, the first thing I want to talk about is regions. So region, for those of you who don't know, quick recap, are like in LLVM, the body of a function. It's a group of blocks that forms a CFG. And it's a sequential list of operations, and the control flows from one operation to the next. That's very similar to LLVM. Now, in MLIR, we call them regions because they can be nested. For example, here you have an if and an else, and you have the true branch and the false branch, and they both are regions themselves. Now, something new in MLIR, maybe not so new now, but new since, since the last presentation here, um, is that we have a new kind of region. We call them graph regions. They contain a single block. But contrary to LLVM basic block and to regular regions, there is no ordering. Operations can be in any order and don't imply any control of execution flowing from one to the next. You can also have SSA value cycles directly in the SSA graph. So it's no longer a DAG. And this is very powerful and very useful to build things like machine learning data for graph, to build circuit level logic. And actually, this feature was brought to us by our friends in the circuit project who are doing harder modeling but also synchronous domain and many other representation benefits from things that are not directly one single flow of control. And we have a new proposal. If you want to hear more about it, you can come in the quick talk session today to hear Jeff and I present you about multiple entry, multiple exit MLR region. And now we're going to talk about interface. And I'd like to welcome Jeff on stage to remind us about app interfaces. Hey. I know we all love interfaces in MLIR, and I'm sure we all know what those are. But for those who don't, an interface in MLIR allows you to decouple the implementation of a system from the forest of dialects and all those operations that exist out in the wild. You can implement passes, transformations, verifiers, interpreters, whatever kind of code you want, operating just on operation interfaces. And then dialects and operations can plug into them. You can model side effects. You can model tiling. Um, but, you know, now these days, we don't, we don't just want operations to have this kind of power. Now types and attributes can implement interfaces. They can implement concepts like shape type. Tensor and the vector type now implement this shape type interface, which allows any other type to plug into a shape type. We also have uh, dialect implementations for fallback interfaces. This helps dialects that have lots of unregistered operations. The dialect itself can provide an implementation 
for interfaces on unregistered ops. So now even unregistered ops can be useful in CSE or dead code elimination. This is also useful for the dialect to go and call some sort of external thing to get the implementation details of an interface, like TensorFlow dialect can use the TensorFlow op registry directly to get the side effects of an operation. We also have promise interfaces, where an operation say, I promise that I will have an implementation for this interface in the compiler, but then it's up to someone else, you, to go and provide this implementation. This allows you to separate your dependencies nicely. Uh, and one example of this is uh, in dialect extensions, which can be used to inject promise interfaces for, for example, bufferization. And this can allow you to cut dependencies, like we don't want the Linog dialect to depend on all that bufferization infrastructure. You can plug these two pieces together in your op tool or whatever. There's also a lot of other things you can do with dialect extensions. You can just add operations to dialects. You can add types. You can add attributes. You can, yeah. And I hear that's how the transform dialect works as well. Yeah, so interfaces are great. They were one of the first system in MLIR of extensibility, and now we're taking it to the next level, completing all aspects of MLIR and building on top of that. But Jeff, um, there's something else that you may be able to talk to us about, right? We got I a new data flow yeah, engine. I love extensibility, and one of the things that MLIR has been missing for a long time is a framework for building data flow analysis. Now, there are data flow analyses in MLIR. There's the well, there's just the forward analysis, SCCP, but now we have a whole framework for building this. It's extensible, it's pluggable, and you can, you know, you have pieces, you can connect them together, you can build out of tree analyses and mix them with in tree analyses. Uh, and it's only really got like a handful of components that you can choose to extend. In fact, we've got a talk later today um, with uh, Tom from ARM, who is gonna, we're gonna talk together about the data flow analysis, and he will talk about how Flang is using it actually to do some cool stuff. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, great work. I'm looking forward to this talk. And um, now moving on to our next topic, uh, data layout. Um, data layout is pretty important. This is uh, necessary to connect to, to LLVM and to be able to target a wide range of targets. And Alex, why don't you join me here and tell everyone about it? Yeah, so LLVM has a data layout representation. Basically, why do we need data layout? Normally, it would have a type like an i32, an integer, and it's fine, but on some systems, we cannot actually read all the types from memory or we store them with like gaps and so on. So LLVM has nice, neat little data layout that's represented at the top of the module. And it's working for LLVM, but it doesn't really work for MLIR because MLIR does not have a fixed set of types. So what is a data layout of index or of tensor or of like your custom type that you add in your dialect? So I also, like, like everyone in MLIR, I like extensibility. Uh, so we did this really extensible data layout and target information subsystem where you can basically have a data layout with everything parameterized. So you can parameterize whatever layout properties you want for your type. Can be like the simple size alignment uh, kind of information. Can be something like memref alignment. Uh, can be also target information that's specific to a dialect. So for example, you can say my GPU dialect is known to work on this kind of GPU with 32 threads or whatnot. Uh, so everything goes through interfaces that Jeff mentioned, and it's really an underused feature of MLIR, so please use it more. Oh, thank you, Alex. I love the way uh, this subsystem to model data layout, as you mentioned, is actually implemented with MLIR construct. It's a dialect itself. Um, and moving on to the next topic, uh, I heard about the transform dialect. Do you want to tell more about that? Uh, yes, yeah, so transform dialect is a little weird of a beast here and it's the complete opposite of my previous work on data layout apparently. And we looked at a bunch of previous work, mostly in research, but now apparently modular are doing kind of the same thing with schedules. So a lot of people want to build schedules for programs. So they want to say, well, here's my program, but here's another part of the program or different programs that tells the compiler how to execute it. So it tells like, I want to reorder my loops in this way, or I want to put some data in some memory. I don't want to write in code. I want to write it as an instruction separately in a separate language or in the same language. Hmm. And it's not even a very new idea. Apparently, schedules existed like in the 90s, probably even before that. I just didn't look that far. Oh, yeah, that's very interesting. And so what about MLIR, right? Because now those schedules are programs 
they are kind of DSLs. Mm -hmm. We need to express those DSL and compile those DSL, right? And integrate this in MLR. What do we do? Well, it's MLIR. In MLIR, everything is a dialect. So obviously, schedules are also a dialect. Uh, so we designed this thing called the transfer dialect. And the idea is, if you have a schedule in DSL, it would compile down to this dialect. And then the MLIR infrastructure will take it from there and manage this application. So here we have a very simple example where we go and match matrix multiplication. So if in the original code you have matrix multiplication, you get an IR object pointing to that operation. And then you can have IR operations that will explain to the compiler what it should do with that operation. So in this example, it will go and tile it by introducing a loop, and it can do something further with that. Fantastic. Thank you, Alex. Um, and if you want to know more about the transform dialect, Alex did a full presentation at an MLI open meeting. So the recording on the slides are online. There's also the full transform dialect documentation. But even better, tomorrow at 4 p.m., you can get your hands on and see concrete example because Alex is giving a full tutorial on the transform dialect and the possibilities it offers. Uh, and now let's talk about IRDL. IRDL, right? Yes. What can you tell us about IRDL, Mathieu? So to quote just Alex, in MLIR, everything is a dialect. So why not having dialect definitions be a dialect? So that's what kind of our goal with IRDL, is to make ODS, take it, and transform it into a program or dialect. So if we want, we can define, define like something like simple dialect. Here, simple example, CMath. We can add a type. We can add attributes. We can add operations. And the idea is that it's kind of declarative, a way to kind of reason with it, and we also like are thinking of upstreaming more kind of IDL, lower, lower level dialects to make it a bit like more performance. So what can we do with IDL? So the, what we added recently is being able to load new dialects at runtime in MLIR opt, meaning that we can add this IDL program, we can add another program using this dialect, and that's it. We can just now have dynamic dialects. Oh, using MLIR to define MLIR dialects. Like, that's a whole new level of metaprogramming. Um, and if you want to know more about IRDL, there is a paper published at uh, PLDI from Mathieu. Uh, you have the recording on slides from PLDI. Uh, there was also an MLIR open presentation that was recorded and that is online. Um, here is an example where in Python you can create IRDL, actually. And this is coming from the XDSL project. On the left, you have the Python definition of an MLIR operation. And that will generate IRDL. There's a full notebook online where you can play with this. Um, and if you want to know more about this, uh, Mathieu is coming back tomorrow at 2 p.m. Uh, to tell you all about this and prototyping MLIR in Python. Um, moving on to the next topic, we're going to talk about serialization. And I'm going to invite Jack to tell us about bytecode. Yeah. So I mean, well, all the previous ones have been a little bit more on the dynamic side and memory side. Uh, in, in this case, we're going to go a little bit more to you know, like the on disk and uh, unit representation part. Uh, MLIR now has a round trippable uh, bytecode serialization format. You know, so this enables like uses from on disk storage, interchange between tools, uh, cheaper to pass across you know uh, binary boundaries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, this is this bytecode format can is even used in some end-to-end -end flows from so for example. You know, ML frameworks such as JAX and or uh, Torch MLIR natively now produces the MLIR bytecode, and you have some deployment targets that are able to consume them as well. Now, MLIR bytecode, it, it works out of the box with your dialect. So we made it in such a way, relying on the, the few fundamental concepts in MLIR to be able to represent uh, your, your dialects without you needing to do anything additional. Uh, so th this, you know, there's a lot of ways to like, uh, customize it, et cetera, et cetera. But like one of the consequences of, of this and the, the, the generic way of it being supported is it is not actually sensitive to, to changes in, in your operation assembly syntax. You know, so changes to the dialect parser would not affect it. Uh, it, it is built with specific speed size tra trade-offs. So, <clears throat> so for example, entities are, are byte aligned. So compared to like the LVMs with compress, you know, we, we're having on, uh, using bytes here to make it easier and faster to load. Uh, it uses an efficient uh, variant encoding. Um, and in a, in a way, like MLIRs in memory structure actually makes the, the encoding quite easy. Uh, because everything is so like, such unique in the context, you know, we can utilize that mapping from the, the unique values to handles. So pretty much everything becomes a handle, and the var variant encoding is used pervasively. 
Um, but we do enable uh, exposing like interfaces, so for, for different dialects, to be able to more efficiently store uh, their, their types and attributes, you know, and, and, and this enables you to get a very compressed format still. Uh, we have features such as lazy loading, only loading the parts that you're working on that, that's being added at the moment. Um, the, the, the bytecode itself is, you know, provides a point of stability for like interop with these things. And I think here, you know, I should be clear, this is, we're talking about the format, some stability, not necessarily the dialects. Uh, dialects themselves, you know, are responsible for what they do, and then they can opt into some processes and, and mechanisms to enable stability, but that doesn't work out of the box. Uh, and there's also versioning support. So abilities to, to uh, um, you know, to opt in per dialect, specify a version for it, to add upgrade hooks, so that you can, you can load serialized versions. Um, you know, and there's, I think, quite a lot of active work ongoing here. And if folks want to find more info, you know, there's the web page as well as the original RFC on MLR bytecode and its design. Now, with the bytecode, you know, so it's stored on this, it's serialized. We, we go from this to back in memory as well as like the MLR context. You know, so by loading this into the context, creating the attributes, the operations. And as I mentioned, the structure actually makes it quite simple. We were able to go from the handles in the bytecode to, uh, to pointers of the unique values in the context, rather trivially making it easy to load. Now, one of the, the, the values in the context uh, pointers that we utilize is actually attributes. Now, attributes, as I think most of the folks here know, is a mechanism to store data on these operations. So if you have your operation here, and I, I, I assume a lot of folks have already seen like the animated version of, of the, this, the syntax, uh, you know, we have on this operation a list of attributes. So these are constant named arguments to the operation, and these are values stored uh, associated with the operation, but stored in the context. These are the attributes that folks mostly use. Now, attributes have a couple of, you know, uh, attrib attributes, uh, properties. Uh, attributes are immutable. They are unique in the MLR context. That means for two attributes of the same value, you can detect that by way of just pointer comparison. They are destroyed and released only when the MLR context is de destroyed. So this is something where as you're creating new attributes in your context, it accumulates over time until you destroy the context. On an operation in particular, these attributes are, are stored in a dictionary attribute. So the storage on the op is one attribute, which is a dictionary. Now, this has the implication that updates of attributes on an operation is actually quite expensive. Because that means you've, when you update it, you have to first materialize it again, you have to then hash it and unique it in the context to make sure that the the thing you're updating, there's only one instance of it. This requires you to, to utilize locking for phrase safety and potential copying, right? It, additionally, the, the APIs presented here uh, mixes inherit and discardable attributes. So in MLR, an operation, you have certain aspects that are inherent, they're verified, they're expected, and then others that are discardable that are just added. And at the moment, the API does not differentiate between those two if you're using attributes. Now, Contrasted properties are similar but different. You know, they, they are able to uh, give you the ability to associate data with the operation, but you know they they are and they are meant as a replacement for the inherent attributes. So these are the ones you have to find in ODS that are verified on the op that you know the op knows what to do with. And along with this, the properties now allow you to have a native inline C++ storage in the operation. This means it, it, is, it is not, you don't have to do all the, the round trips from loading and materializing. You have the, the, the native C++ object that you can operate on. Uh, it also means you can, you can mutate it as you go. And they are actually fully separate from discardable attributes. So now you have very clear differences between these two systems. So to give an example, you know, you can, for example, have the struct, the property struct for a given operation, free members, N64, STD vector, shared pointer, and you can have all of these natively associated with your operation. So that when at runtime you're querying this, you don't have to, for example, in the case of A, go query an integer attribute and then get the value and then convert from APN, you get your in 6040, right? And so this is, I think, a thing that opens up a lot of ways to you know, enable more efficiency, avoid some foot guns that folks you know, have run into by you know, in, in, incrementally updating the dictionary attribute on operation. Uh, and at the moment, there's, there's a low effort migration uh, available. 
So it's one where it's one flag to opt in to using the new format. Uh, it, is, it is mostly backwards compatible, you know, and it, it's something that is, I think we're quite excited about. If you want to learn more about this, you know, there is a great presentation at the MLR Open Design Meeting uh, where there was a deep dive on MLR internal operation attributes presented by Mehdi. And I, I advise you guys to go look at that. And actually, speaking of Mehdi, I think he's quite, there's quite an interesting work with respect to actions that you want to talk us about. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jacques. Um, yeah, uh, one of the, those were two major improvements, the bytecode and the properties are major change. Properties is very recent. It was landed just last week. Uh, so we're still learning everything we can do with it. Now moving on to actions. Action, it's a way to encapsulate any IR transformation, right? The way to think about it, the kind of tools we want to build with it are things where we want to trace the compiler, understand what, more what's happening during compilation. So this is more a tool for compiler developers and people building tools on top of MLIR. You can implement concepts like compiler fuel. Compiler fuel means you're giving some fuel to the compiler to optimize to a certain point. And that enables bisection technique to find bugs, find which optimization is responsible for a change. But we also want to do some interactive debugging, like debugging the compiler, being able to add new capability to something like GDB, where you would want to break points not on the compiler source program, but on the comp program being compiled. Let's say I want to add a breakpoint, and any time the compiler is going to change the IR, matching the original source location of the IR. This will be possible with actions. So compared to pass, pass is the usual way we define a compiler, but they are pretty large scoped. And um, a pass is like a contract where you take a large piece of IR and you produce a new large piece of IR. And we built a lot of tooling and infrastructure around it. You can print the IR before and after every pass. You can instrument and reorganize passes. Um, action brings this to a new level and a fine-grained control of the compiler. Um, we don't want to keep all those uh, niceties that we have with passes specific to these coarse grain um, uh, mechanisms. And when we think about what Alex showed you with the transform dialect, it's even more important because we're breaking down passes to allow you finer grain control of transformations. So it's important to have other mechanisms to uh, trace the compiler. Here's an example of a trace I produced with actions. Uh, the action allowed me to intercept, uh, th so that's a compilation of flung, flung compiling a source file. Uh, uh, visualized in a Chrome tracing uh, window, and I apologize for the quality. Uh, it's a bit blurry. But um, what we see um, at, uh, is, is a sequence of passes, and so every pass matches to one action, so we can capture this. But we can also capture um, the, um, so those are the passes. We can capture the nesting of the passes, right? This is the inliner, and this is the pipeline inside the inliner. And um, what we see at the bottom here is for every pass, when I select a pass, I have here the pass name, but also what kind of IR the pass is currently operating on. And I can match back to the source code. Right? This was a Fortran file, line five here. It might be a bit small to read. Um, I think I'm zooming on it here. Um, so this is the canonicalizer running on a function. We have the function name, and we know where in the source file it was done. So this is a visualization, but you have access to those information programmatically. So you can start building filters and say, I only want to see anything that touches these pieces of code. Uh, zooming in, we have patterns. And uh, we see that these uh, pink sections is actually you know, small individual actions. And zooming more, those are pattern actions. And for example, if I select this pattern, I can see that this is a specific pattern operating on one specific operation, again, matching one specific source line. So we have very fine-grained uh, analysis capabilities. Um, so those are examples of actions. Even tiling a loop can be an action. Uh, and the kind of tooling we can build with it. We haven't built it. Action is very recent. It's been landed last month. Uh, so we have to build all this timing, uh, those uh, tooling, and I'm very excited about the possibilities of that. Uh, imagine that you want to build the O0. You can build the O0 for Flang saying, I want to build my project, but please don't optimize this range of the source code. And this is possible with actions. Um, we haven't been able to talk about everything uh, during today, during this talk, um, but MLIR comes with batteries. It comes with code generation capability uh, and blocks, reusable blocks. So we have dialects to model vectors abstraction. Uh, we have dialect to target GPUs and other accelerators similarly. We have dialect to abstract OpenMP or OpenACC concepts. Uh, we have Linux, which is in active development and model 
uh, hyper-rectangular iteration spaces and every transformation you want to do around that. We have better Python bindings. They can be better. We welcome your contributions, but they are there. Um, and one exciting domain of development is sparse compilation. We have the taco-style code generation in MLIR now. And we have an end-to-end -end flow. And I don't have time to get in details, but you will find those talks online. They were presented at the MLI Open meeting. Um, and we can now run those sparse compilation on GPU, because very recently, Art implemented support for Qsparse, the NVIDIA library for, for sparse um, computation on GPU. And you can access all of that directly from JAX through MLIR. There are many other aspects of the core infrastructure uh, that I mentioned here, and I left those links uh, for future reference. Um, I won't have time to cover them. Um, but MLIR is growing, has more and more capability, and uh, we wanted to share this with you today, and I hope it gets you even more excited about MLIR. Thank you. Thank you, Amelie. Time for one, maybe two questions. Any, please come to the mic. I'll get one here. Thanks, Mindy. Uh, you presented things that are in flow. Uh, tough question, maybe. Uh, what, what's in the pipeline, like you know, just initial discussions, and that we might say in coming months or a couple of months? So, sorry. So, I... so, what are the new things that uh, you envision should be there in MLIR? It's not there, but should be there. Uh, in like six months, etc., where, where the discussions are just um, starting. Yeah, uh, it's a difficult question, right? Because this talk is really about what we just did. And I mentioned things that we worked out hard to land just last week. Properties is a profound change in MLIR. So one of the things I'm looking forward are everything we're going to do with it. Um, there are lots of things that are very young in MLIR that needs to be fleshed out. And I think there are phases in a project where you do rapid innovation and introduction of new concepts. And there are probably phases where you need to start you know, stabilizing and making those concepts more usable. And I think you're talking about the next six months to a year. What I personally believe is that we should start making many of those concepts uh, better. Right? Properties is not totally fully integrated in MLIR. It needs to be there. Python bindings can be better. Um, MHC might be a, a topic of our development right now. It allows us to generate source code from MLIR. You could you know, emit some dialects, do some transformation, but then you want to target CUDA. Uh, or you want to target OpenCL because you have a vendor that has an OpenCL compiler. Um, and this is, uh, this is probably what's going to be presented at the next US Dev meeting if people are delivering on, on their current project, I think. Those are, those are very interesting topics. Maybe we need to invest more in documentation than new features uh, in MLIR. So those are also things uh, that don't seem like shiny or worth of a talk, but that are very impactful for every user. OK, thank you, Mehdi. And let's thank Mehdi and all the speakers again. Thanks, everyone.